Hello, and welcome to the discussion series of Buddha Nights. I am Munira Hashimi, playwright, actor, and director. In 2005, I co-founded Simo Film Association of Culture and Art in Herat, west of Afghanistan. March 11, 2013, I co-founded a Night with Buddha Festival to commemorate the destruction of world cultural heritage, the Buddha statues of Bamiyan. The destruction of Buddha statues in 2001, which carried out in the continuation of decades of ethnic cleansing with the aim of destroying the history of Hazara people, was beyond massacre. It was a cultural genocide. 21 years later after destruction, even the remains, the empty niche of Buddha statues are again in danger in Bamiyan. This year, we at Theatre Deuce with collaboration of Safe Heaven Freedom Talks, arranged a series of discussion to understand the different aspects of destruction of cultural heritage, destroying history, forced forgetting, social discrimination, and genocide against Hazara people. Our guests for this discussion are Anis Rezai and Satara Mohammadi. Anis Rezai is an MPhil candidate at the University of Oxford. She holds a BA in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Essex. Anis has been closely working with Hazara community-based organization in the UK to help facilitate the integration of Hazara into UK society. She's a contributor to Guardian Australia and writes on Hazaras, Afghanistan, and refugee issues. She completed her dissertation on Australia's refugee policy at University of Oxford. She has a BA in international relations and human rights and is currently undertaking her Juris Doctorate at Monash University Law School in Melbourne, Australia. Sitara is a legal researcher with the Afghan Human Rights Democracy Organization. The discussion will be moderated by Asad Buddha. Asad Buddha is a freelance writer. He studied sociology and Islamic theology and has been working as a researcher and university lecturer in Kabul. He is the former icon guest writer in Kavsta. Det återvändande ågat, a chapter of his personal memoir, was published in Varmland Writers Anthology. He has worked with Rick's Theater and Theater Deuce on a project called Little History, resulted in publishing a book under the title of Hoppet's Territorium. Southern Stars and Homo Sacer of Fogla Napolinia Gotham are his last published text in the Udok Bild and Govet Brivester Art Gallery. He is also involved in visual art, focusing on the demonization of political enemies and aesthetic aspect of extremist and religious violence. We take one minute silence for the last shocking attacks on Hazara people in Afghanistan. In, the, in these attacks, over 300 innocent people were injured and 250 were killed. 126 of those who were killed were school children. Thank you. Thank you, dear Anis and Satara for being with us. Uh, now I leave the platform for Asad and our honest guest uh, to start the discussion. Thank you.
thank you, Munira. Thank you, uh, Safe Haven and Freedom Talks and Theater Deuce. Thank you very much, Sitora and uh, Anis. Welcome to this program. <coughs> Uh, in Afghanistan, we are going to talk today about uh, uh, intersectionality matter, problematizing the mainstream discourse on gender analysis in Afghanistan context. So it's because Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, we have different narratives of women, uh, the very, very um, well now narrative in Afghanistan is religious narrative of women. So in this narrative, the women are the symbol of shame and guilt, the embodied religious belief. And the other narrative is the kinship or the ethnical narrative of women. So in this narrative, women reduced as a kind of collective embodied of tribe and ethnicity as enormous or something. And in a very short time, we had a Soviet Union woman narrative in Afghanistan. So they talked about the women as worker. So then the Mujahideen came and Taliban came after the collapsing of Taliban, the uh, international community came in Afghanistan. We had a lot of activities uh, about gender equality and uh, uh, and women issues in Afghanistan. But at the same time, we see that uh, this kind of narrative also has uh, a lot of problem. So the main problem maybe uh, in, in this uh, context was, so they didn't focus on the context of uh, women experience in Afghanistan or gender discrimination in Afghanistan. The women issues become a kind of uh, gender gender industry in Afghanistan. So for those who work with women issues and gender gender discrimination, finding money and selling the women suffering was more important than working for women or maybe than social equality. So maybe one of the main reason why that's happened is because many of them. Uh, 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 didn't have enough knowledge about the, the context of gender discrimination in Afghanistan. So today we uh, have two guests to talk about that. Uh, I want to start with uh, uh, Anis Rizoi. So my question of uh, Anis is, <coughs> Anis said, please, uh, could you tell us more about the mainstream discourses for gender in Afghanistan context and why is it problematic? Thank you, Assad. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this talk. Uh, thank you. Special thanks to uh, Safe Haven Freedom Talks. I think um, in order to answer that question, it would be important for us to ask why mainstream discourse is important. So. <clears throat> The reason as to why mainstream discourse or public discourse regarding an issue is important is because uh, public discourse structures the way we think, the way we talk, and the way we reflect on an issue. In the case of Afghanistan, the mainstream discourse on gender has shaped our understanding of women's um, uh, struggles and challenges um, in Afghanistan context, and it has in turn shape our advocacy and activism to transform those social injustices that women in Afghanistan face. And um, that advocacy in turn has somehow influenced politics and um, policy initiatives regarding the um, injustices or social injustices that women in Afghanistan face. Now, the problem with the mainstream discourse is that it has limited our understanding of uh, gender injustice or it has limited our understanding of the experience of women in Afghanistan. Uh, why I'm saying this is because the mainstream discourse um, on gender in Afghanistan has oversimplified the experience of women uh, in Afghanistan in the sense that it has rendered the complexity of women's experience in Afghanistan unimportant. Afghanistan is an incredibly diverse country. There are many uh, ethnic, religious, and cultural groups who coexist 
within that political space. And um, given the history of power imbalance and power dynamics between these uh, different groups, one can clearly state that the experience of women in Afghanistan is entirely different. They, the way women experience social injustice in Afghanistan uh, is, is different across different groups. The mainstream discourse has uh, not only oversimplified that experience, it has also uh, presented a homogenous and a singularized um, a kind of, it has homogenized and singularized women in Afghanistan and also the, the disadvantages that women in Afghanistan face. It has, it has uh, been constantly talking about the gender related issues that women face at the cost of completely excluding the experience of women um, in Afghanistan um, from uh, an ethnic and uh, from a religious uh, kind of point of view. Um, as I said, Afghanistan is an incredibly diverse country, and that diversity calls in for uh, a nuanced approach to understand the, the different ways that women in Afghanistan um, experience social injustices. And um, given that the, the conversation is going to be uh, mainly focused on the experience of Hazara women, um, and um, the uh, Hazara women, uh, for example, or women, we can say women from the Sikh um, community, they ex their experience is in Afghanistan is not premised on their gender identity. Their experience is premised on their ethnic, religious, as well as gender identity. The discrimination, they, they face discrimination simultaneously based on their gender, on their ethnicity, and on their religion. And the mainstream discourse has failed to incorporate this aspect into um, uh, the conversation and also into our understanding. So this is called a kind of a multi-level discrimination that uh, requires a different approach, uh, a different um, uh, a tool or a different analytical framework that can help us understand that. And that is why we, um, Take, we took it upon ourselves to talk about intersectionality and how intersectionality uh, as a framework can help us understand all these nuances and these complexities. Intersectionality um, is a, an, an analytical framework that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw uh, in the US and um, Kimberly is a uh, uh, a scholar, a writer, and a civil rights advocate. And she coined uh, the intersectionality uh, as a concept in order to highlight the distinct experience of African-Americans and women from minority backgrounds in the United States, whose experience was shaped by the intersection of their ethnic, religious, as well as gender identity. And in this, uh, in the context of our today's conversation, we are going to apply intersectionality on the experience of Hazara women. And for us, in order to be able to do that, I think it would be important to uh, understand who are the Hazaras and uh, how the, Hazor, the experience of Hazara women in Afghanistan is distinct and different and how intersectionality can help us um, understand that better. Uh, so you mean, uh, so they reduce multiple factor to one factor in Afghanistan. So the, the approach was very, maybe one dimensional. So we have we, we a multi-dimensional approach to the gender discrimination in Afghanistan, uh, especially on focusing of uh, Hazara people, Hazara women as the negative side of uh, uh, Afghan history as uh, excluded part of uh, uh, Afghan history uh, and uh, situated in, in forbidden side. So uh, I want to uh, continue the historical background of discussion with uh, Sitara. Uh, uh, Sitara, could you elaborate on the history of Hazara and that what are some distinct challenge experienced 
by Hazara women in Afghanistan? Uh, thank you for your question. And thank you for the organizers uh, to bring um, this platform together for us to be able to have this very important uh, conversation. I would like to begin as we do here in Australia uh, by acknowledging the land from which I journey today, uh, the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation uh, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also wish to pay my respects uh, and extend my condolences to the victims and the families of the targeted attacks of the past few days across Afghanistan. Um, in particular, the young stu Hazara students whose lives were taken so tragically during the deadly attacks on their school um, in Dashtibarchi, west of Kabul. It is important that I begin by stating that the Hazara people are not a homogenous group, that we have Shia Hazaras, Sunni Hazaras, Ismaili Hazaras, as well as atheist Hazaras. Together, the Hazara population make up roughly more than 30% of the total population of Afghanistan. Ongoing victims of discrimination and violence, the Hazaras remain amongst the most persecu persecuted groups and make up one of the largest groups of refugees around the world. The Hazaras are historically the most discriminated ethnic group in Afghanistan and saw little improvement in their situation despite the presence of foreign forces over the last 20 years in the country. Sanctioned state persecution, discrimination and exclusion against the Hazaras began in the late uh, 19th century. In bringing the region's many different elements under a centralized authority, the Pashtun ruler at the time Amir Abdurrahman Khan identified the Hazaras as a threat to ethnic Pashtun dominance and therefore incited religious and ethnic hatred to conquer them in a series of exceptionally brutal wars. Abdurrahman did this by instigating a jihad against the Hazaras who were perceived in his eyes as infidels due to Hazaras links to Shia sect of Islam in a predominantly Sunni Muslim state of Afghanistan. Some 62 to 63% of the Hazara population was eliminated by Abdurrahman, either killed, sold into slavery or forced into exile. To depopulate the Hazarajat region, the Abdurrahman region, uh, government issued royal decrees authorizing Pashtun nomads known as Kochis to access and take over Hazara's lands and their livestock by force. In particular, Hazara women were used as slaves by dominant groups in the country. Flowing from, from this, Hazaras are still being attacked and killed. Their homes are burnt or taken away by Pashtun coaches today. Coaches still claim annual land rights based on the decrees issued by Abdurrahman in the late 19th century. Then, victorious Abdurrahman claimed that Hazaras saw, Afghans saw Hazaras as, quote, enemies of their country and religion, unquote, laying the foundation of the Hazaras' ongoing persecution, exclusion, and discrimination by dominant groups today. Significantly, this established a pattern in which successive governments marginalized the Hazaras for much of the 19th and 20th centuries, and during the monarchy from the 1929 onwards, when during the process of Pashtunization, Hazaras were made to conceal their identities in order to obtain state identification cards. Uh, so you mean this kind of uh, historical background uh, influenced the Hazara people, uh, yes. especially Hazara women. So if we want to, for example, talk about the gender discrimination uh, to, to cover all women in Afghanistan, so we need, uh, we need other frameworks. So the mainstream discourses uh, doesn't tell anything. So this is, do you mean, uh, because of this unique experience of Hazara people as uh, excluded uh, in Afghan history, we need uh, a kind of uh, new perspective uh, or intersectional approach, etc. 
Absolutely. And if I may just um, cover a few points in terms of historical um, context. Um, so in his books, uh, the Hazaras of Afghanistan, Sayyid Askar Masavi says that until the 1970s, the killings of the Hazara people were declared by Sunni Pashtun clerics as an accepted and sanctified means of gaining God's favor and securing oneself in a place of heaven. The suppression, discrimination, and persecution against the Hazaras endured in the late 1990s under then the rule of the Taliban. Uh, based on ethnic and religious identity during the 1990s, the Taliban starved thousands of Hazaras to death by blocking food access to them. The Taliban's massacre of thousands of Hazaras in Mazar Sharif in 1998 remains one of the most notorious atrocities in the 40 year conflict in the country. During the massacre, between 8,000 to 15,000 Hazaras are estimated to have been killed in just three days, an event, an event that became the trigger for major refugee flows uh, into Western, in Western countries. During the, the massacres, the Taliban presented three options for the Hazara people, to become Sunni Muslims, to leave Afghanistan, or to risk being killed. This, Massacre has been described genocidal in its ferocity by author Ahmad Rashid. So while violence is widespread across Afghanistan and the suffering of all people is collective, Hazaras have been subjected to a chain of systemic and targeted attacks for persecution, murder and genocide based on three main factors. Hazara identity as an ethnic group, religious identity as Hazaras are predominantly Shia Muslims in a Sunni majority state. And more recently, Hazaras have been targeted based on uh, hard earned success in education, in sports, in politics, and for progressive and democratic values. Hazaras are, um, are mentioned to be the beating heart of Afghanistan and the main ethnic group that can challenge and threaten the religious conservative views, extremism, nepotism, and ethnic favoritism, which has ingrained both the Afghan society and the government throughout history. Hazara children and youth, particularly young girls, are routinely attacked, mostly because Hazaras as a population are the driving force of social change, freedom, and the progression of society, as well as the emancipation of girls and women in the country. So the Hazara people are perceived as ethnically, ethnically, religiously, physically, and linguistically distinct in Afghanistan. The plights of Hazaras is rooted in a history of slavery and oppression that dates back way before the current conflict and violence in the country. Hazara women in particular continue to remain the most vulnerable, subjugated and subjected to discrimination and persecution based on their ethnic, gender, and religious identity. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was a very uh, good uh, historical background and why we, why we need to see from uh, other angle or other perspective to the woman. So the women who are a generation and generation more than one century, they are a target killing of uh, the political uh, uh, a political st structure, and they are target killing of many different form of uh, uh, maybe government. So to understand themselves, <clears throat> maybe we need the uh, other framework. So I want to uh, ask Anis more about that. So as you mentioned before, so uh, intersectionality is a kind of uh, framework which provide us to analysis the gender discrimination in Afghanistan and uh, can you explain a little more about that? Um, yeah sure thank you um, as Sitara John pointed out um, Hazara, Hazara people um, are experiencing or have been um, um, experiencing oppression injustice discrimination uh, based on their ethnicity, their religion, and the fact that they are far more progressive uh, ethnic group in Afghanistan in comparison to other uh, ethnic groups. But when it comes to Hazara women, there is another 
um, element to this. There is another factor that uh, shape uh, a distinct experience for Hazara women, and that is gender. So in the sense that Hazara women's experience in Afghanistan is shaped by the intersection of their gender, um, uh, Hazara women's experience is shaped by the intersection of their eth ethnic, religious, as well as their gender identity. So it is the intersection of all these um, uh, identities that shape a distinct and a unique experience for Hazara women. So uh, this is um, a, this is called um, a kind of a multiple subordinate and identities. Hazara women, in the sense, are not only subordinated because of their gender identity. Hazara women are subordinated because of their religious identity, because of their ethnic identity, and because of the fact that they that they lead um, uh, a liberal, uh, progressive lives in, com in in comparison to a woman from other uh, groups in Afghanistan. So that these all factors has uh, intersected uh, and shaped um, a different um, experience for them. And uh, as I said at the very beginning uh, about the mainstream discourse, I said that uh, mainstream discourse has limited our understanding of uh, gender issues in Afghanistan. It has limited our uh, understanding of women's experience in Afghanistan. And in order to be able to address that limited understanding, and in order to be able to understand the complexity of women's experience in Afghanistan, we need a new perspective. We need a new uh, framework, um, and that is intersectionality. Intersectionality uh, can uh, help us understand the complex ways in which gender, religion, and ethnic identities interact and intersect with, with one another and shape a distinct and unique experience for uh, women from uh, the um, ethnically uh, oppressed groups such as the Hazaras. Uh, so, you mean, uh, for example, uh, Hazara people as a diverse uh, community? So because Hazara people are uh, Shia, uh, Ismaili, and Sunni. So if even there is a Sunni Hazara woman, so she is under discrimination, different discrimination because of her identity and physical structure. If they are, so they are not same with the other woman. So if they are, for example, Hazara, uh, Shia people, so they, they also uh, discriminate by different uh, factors. For, if they are Ismaili, so they are a minority. So, so maybe they experience multi multi uh, in the factor discrimination. So you you mean that the intersectionality perspective help us to to understand this kind of factor better? Um, exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, and also with respect to um, they um, given that uh, as Sitara also um, highlighted that Hazaras are not a homogeneous group. Hazaras are um, a very internally very diverse group. Um, with respect to the experience of Sunni uh, women from the Sunni Hazara women from the Sunni religion, they experience a distinct kind of uh, injustice um, in a, in, within the Hazara community. But whereas when it comes to the experience of uh, uh, Shia um, Hazaras, they experience a distinct uh, kind of um, injustice within the broader system. So it's kind of it's very complex, and uh, what I'm trying to state is that intersectionality can help us see that complexity. It can help us understand that complexity, and it help it can help us um, uh, formulate policies uh, that can uh, transform those just those specific injustices that uh, target certain groups within the society. And um, as as previously um, uh, we talked about intersectionality, it's um, intersectionality is all about a matter of justice. How can we use and how can an intersectional approach uh, help us um, uh, bring justice to uh, these uh, women from uh, multiply, um, multiple subordinating identities? So this is about justice. Once we understand that women in Afghanistan experience uh, distinct uh, social injustices, distinct inequalities, inequalities that are premised on their ethnicity, on their religion, as well as on their gender, 
that is when we can add, we can effectively and meaningfully address this um, issue. And in addition to that, I think it would be important for us to also highlight that uh, when it comes to um, gender issues, um, gender analysis, uh, it is incredibly important for us to acknowledge that we cannot understand uh, gender issues um, as um, an isolated kind of system of power or power structure. It is part and parcel of the uh, system of power that has shaped a society as a whole. And that intersectionality can help us understand that. And it can help us see how they, um, the power structure within society that subordinates certain groups of people can have a disproportionate impact on those, on women from, from that subordinated group because of their gender as well as their ethnic and religious identities. So that is uh, why intersectionality is incredibly important. Yeah, so uh, I think that is a very important perspective uh, because if we just talk about gender discrimination, very abstract and not distinguish the factor and it would be maybe uh, a lot of problem. And so maybe uh, uh, not understandable to see what's going in Afghanistan as, as Sitara mentioned before that. So there is a lot of issues, historical issues, and a part of uh, uh, conflict, political conflict, is uh, about how to be how with women. So we experienced, as as Tara told, we experienced uh, hist hist historically that uh, uh, what happened to Hazara women. So the uh, uh, Lilius Hamilton uh, book he was your daughter, and there is many report about that uh, in Siraj Tawarikh and also Kandahar Dairi. How Hazara people discriminate, or how, for example, Amir Abdul Rahman army burn Hazara woman in the evening uh, during the uh, 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 1892 and 93 in Rusgan, and and they when they burn the woman, so they uh, they uh, they danced around her burned body. So, so it's maybe because uh, because of that unique experience. For example, Pashtun women they are really experience gender discrimination, but not ethnic discrimination, mm -hmm. not religious discrimination. Uh, because of this, we need this new approach. You mean? Uh, can you talk a little experimentally, and then we will ask Sitara. Uh, so how, for example, how's, how you see the difference, for example, in, in the practice uh, between a Hazara woman and other, for example, there is a lot of uh, women, they are supporting Taliban, advocating for Taliban in the Western countries. So do you mean, is it because they are, uh, they have diff it's because of different experience or maybe uh, what's the reason? So yeah, thank you for that. Again, this takes us back on how the um, mainstream discourse is shaped. So as I said, um, women from the dominant ethnic groups are mainly the ones who represent women from Afghanistan. They represent the experience of women from Afghanistan. And they normally, because of, because of the fact that they are part of the system of power, they are, um, they, they advance, they kind of, um, benefit from that system of power, they are less likely to understand the distinct experience of women who are excluded from that, from that power. And that can be um, Hazara women. And with the women who are, uh, again, this is an, uh, an issue of ethnicity, women who support the Taliban, for example, it's because of the fact that there are certain benefits that they can draw from supporting the Taliban. And the fact that they, uh, in Afghanistan, it is not, only the issue of uh, gender uh, that needs uh, focus. It is actually the issue of uh, the, the fact that um, uh, when it comes to women's rights, uh, the fact that women experience um, injustices, oppression, discrimination on a multi-dimensional level, particularly women from historically subordinated and subjugated groups such as the Hazaras. And um, the other thing, the other factor with the mainstream discourse, and I think it's, it's important to highlight is that um, it is the, the portrayal of Afghanistan as a patriarchal society. 
um, when we talk uh, in every context, when we introduce ourselves that uh, we are from Afghanistan, the first thing that people um, come and um, when it comes to gender issues, of course, they come and ask is um, whether women uh, are allowed to study, whether women are allowed to get an education. And given that the mainstream discourse always talks about patriarchy, uh, lack, women's lack of access to education, um, uh, men's domination of uh, over women, uh, that kind of um, that uh, obscures the the a contribution of um, Hazara men to uh, the development uh, of Hazara women, the contribution of Hazara men. Uh, within, the, within the society, within the community that can facilitate the woman, Hazara woman's access to education, access to resources, and access um, to power within that community, within that small um, system that they have. So that's also kind of a homogenized um, uh, representation or portrayal of Afghanistan within the um, international community. And intersectionality can help us um, understand and address that effectively. Yeah, uh, so that's a good point. As uh, Setara also mentioned, uh, so one of the uh, uh, reasons for discrimination against the Hazara at, at the last decades is because they are really interested in democratic values and they are really interested in new perspective uh, to the Afghanistan based of human rights and uh, they are really there is a very political will in Hazara society for a democratic Afghanistan, a developed Afghanistan. So uh, do you think, Sitara, is it also because of uniqueness of uh, Hazara people experience, or for example, Hazara women, so they are really uh, interested to go to school, so the head of human rights commission, so she was Hazara, the governor of Bamiyan was Hazara, the governor of uh, Daikundi was Hazara. So do you think uh, there is a relationship between uh, this unique Hazara uh, historical experience and this kind of perspective to the society? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, and as Anis echoed in her own um, remarks um, that Hazara women have long been subjugated and subjected to discrimination and violence and persecution based on you know their ethnic identity their religious identity but also their their gender identity as well um, however in the last 20 years of foreign forces intervention in afghanistan uh, it enabled uh, the hazaras particularly women and breathing room uh, to be able to pursue opportunities uh, particularly in education and as a result we had Hazaras, uh, especially women and girls who, who excelled uh, fully in, in areas of education and, uh, and otherwise. Um, Hazara youth in particular, women, uh, both boys and girls uh, began to thrive fully, uh, leaving no stone unturned by making the most of the once in a, life, once in a lifetime opportunity that they had. Um, as, as you mentioned, as a relatively open-minded and liberal uh, society, the number of girls attending schools uh, in Hazara regions uh, exceeded. He also mentioned that Dr. Sima Saman, who, was, uh, Hazara, who is a Hazara, became the first minister of women's affairs and later the, the chairperson of the um, Afghanistan Human Rights Commission, Independent Human Rights Commission. Uh, he also mentioned uh, that Dr. Uh, Habiba Saribi was the first female governor of uh, Bamiyan who was also a Hazara uh, from 2005 to 2013. Uh, but despite all these achievements and progress made by Hazaras, uh, particularly Hazara women and girls, nonetheless, Hazaras uh, have been and continue to be disproportionately targeted and attacked uh, by being singled out uh, uh, you know, for beheadings, for killings, suicide attacks, as well as uh, kidnappings. If I can give a few examples uh, briefly, so in 2015, for example, a terrorist group uh, stopped passengers on buses in Zabul, uh, who then identified them, identified Hazaras, selected them, and then separated them, and then summarily executed uh, nine Hazara passengers by slitting their throats, including two Hazara women 
and one uh, Hazara uh, young girl, Tabassum, who was nine years old then. Uh, another example was the Halo Trust um, in 2021 last year, which also illustrates the distinct nature of these attacks on Hazaras. Uh, again, Hazaras were identified, were selected, were separated, and then cured. Uh, actually, the CEO of Halo Trust, uh, in his statement, James Cowan, mentioned that the attack was ethnically motivated and that the attackers were seeking Hazaras as their target. Um, in Kabul alone in recent years, the Hazara uh, populated area of Dashti Barchi has witnessed a bloodbath of young Hazaras, uh, including girls, as we saw in, in school on a school attack last year in May, uh, as well as maternity hospitals, sporting centers, wedding halls, and other social gatherings. Uh, the 12th May attack on the, um, on the maternity hospital uh, in Kabul illustrates, clearly illustrates the distinct violence and injustice experienced by and perpetrated upon Hazara women uh, who were targeted and so brutally killed during uh, the most vulnerable and fragile moments of their lives when they were giving birth to their newborns. Um, Hazara women in particular have been most affected by these decades long violence and hostility both with respect to their identity as a Hazara, uh, but also their, their gender as a women, but are now facing harsh and new realities uh, under the Taliban with their most basic human rights uh, wiped away uh, by the new militant group. Uh, Hazara women's pain and suffering has, has been and continue to be distinct. Uh, as we saw uh, in the attacks a few days ago on, on the boys' school in Dashtibarchi, where uh, where mothers uh, were running hopelessly around, uh, unable to find the remains of their young uh, sons. Um, they did not have any access uh, to, to get to the hospitals to be able to find um, their children, nor were they able to, to, to donate any form of blood uh, to those who were wounded. Uh, so throughout history, Hazara women, as we mentioned, have been used as, as slaves. Uh, but also deprived of basic rights, uh, such as the very important right to education. And as a result, uh, most Hazara mature women in Afghanistan uh, are illiterate today because they were deprived of that basic, basic right to education uh, based on their gender as a woman, but also their, their identity as a Hazara. Uh, the education of women, for instance, was considered futile in Afghanistan society as it was believed that Hazara women were uh, considered inferior and subordinate to other uh, members of society. Uh, since the return of the Taliban to power in Afghanistan, Hazara women have continuously and disproportionately been targeted, either detained, tortured, and at times uh, killed and their bodies laid uh, on the side of the streets. The Taliban have dismantled the constitutional order that provided some basic rights to the Hazaras. Uh, and have established their Islamic Emirate, which institutionalizes uh, sectarian and et ethnic discrimination and violence uh, towards the Hazaras. Uh, the Hazara people have virtually lost all potential posts which they had in the government, uh, as well as that the Taliban have removed all um, Hazaras from positions of authority in institution and in other, in other uh, places of employment. Um, Lastly, Hazara women have completely been silenced. Uh, if I can give the example of Alia Aziz, who was the head of the Herat Women's Prison, uh, who disappeared in October of last year. Um, family and friends believe that she was detained by the Taliban because of her position as the head of the prison, but also her identity as a, a Hazara woman. She remains uh, missing to this day. There's no information in terms of her whereabouts. Uh, again, just earlier this year, uh, Zainab Abdullahi, a young Hazara woman uh, who's 25, was so-called mistakenly shot in the head by the Taliban. Uh, and this just illustrates the, the very nature and the very real threats the Hazara women uh, particularly face. Uh, have faced throughout history, but now again, under this brutal Taliban regime, both based on their identity uh, as a Hazara, uh, but also their gender as a Hazara woman. 
thank you, Sitara. It's, it was very informative. And so, and we can follow experimentally how the Hazara women are very experiencing very unique uh, gender discrimination. And, and the last question, and maybe very short uh, answer uh, from Anis. Anis, do you think uh, belonging to a diversity or experiencing unique uh, gender discrimination, is it, is it just a a negative experience or it uh, can be positive also. For example, if you not experience this kind of discrimination, how is it uh, possible to see the society from an uh, inclusive perspective, from justice perspective? Uh, isn't it good, for example, that we think that uh, being the member of a minority is just not negative. It's a potential for justice, for uh, social equality also. Mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, as you said, um, Hazaras, um, as a group, Hazaras are far more progressive and far more uh, liberal and open-minded uh, in comparison to other groups in Afghanistan. And that has uh, that has been to the advantage of Hazara women. Um, and that's why we have so many Hazara women role models um, within the, um, uh, the government, as well as within the um, uh, civil um, society, members of civil society that has, uh, that who have been playing significant roles in uh, shaping uh, a different environment for women to, uh, for women from all uh, ethnic and religious groups to um, advocate for their rights. That has been uh, an, an advantage, uh, but if you, uh, that has significantly advantaged Hazaras. But at the same time, if you put that within the uh, broader system, again, the system of power that structures the society, again, um, although Hazaras, Hazara women have uh, enjoyed um, uh, a progressive lives, uh, they have lived, um, uh, they, have, um, they have been leading uh, kind of a liberal uh, lives within Afghanistan, but at the same time, within the broader system, they have experienced uh, uh, systematic and institutional discrimination and oppression. So that is that that is the distinct disadvantage. And I'm not saying that uh, Hazara women, as a member of um, of this of Hazara uh, community or Hazara ethnic group, has been constantly disadvantaged. There are and there have been certain advantages. Uh, for the Hazara women, and given the uh, number of Hazaras, uh, Hazara women who are uh, getting an education, Hazara women who are leading um, and initiating um, social movements within Afghanistan, advancing social changes in Afghanistan, but at the same time, within the uh, broader system, they have been multiply uh, disadvantaged, oppressed, and discriminated against. And that's why we need an intersectional approach to understand uh, all these complexities. Uh, thank you, Setara, and thank you, Munira, and thank you very much, Anis. And uh, today we talked about intersectionality in Afghanistan as a new work to understand the gender discrimination better from another perspective. So uh, uh, Anis talked uh, about why the mainstream discourse is, is not working in Afghanistan and not help us to, to make the gender discrimination understandable. Sitara uh, talked very, uh, de very details about the historical background of uh, Hazara women and uh, about systematic discrimi discrimination against Hazara. Uh, and uh, finally, I need to explain how and what, how intersectionality perspective help us to analyze the complexity of gender discrimination in Afghanistan and why we need to see the gender discrimination from this kind of perspective. Uh, do you want to add more something, uh, Anis and Sitara? Um, I, I don't have um, anything else to add. Um, and I, I just want to say that um, I hope uh, this um, conversation can initiate uh, many conversations on intersectionality 
And I hope this conversation, um, despite uh, the um, certain shortcomings that um, it, um, it has, I hope it inspires Hazara students to undertake a, an, an intersectional approach to gender analysis when it comes to Afghanistan. And I would like to thank all the organizers for organizing this talk and um, thank you to yourself as well. Sitara. Um, thank you for, for this important conversation. I don't have anything um, else to add. Just wanted to echo Anissa's comments uh, in terms of uh, the, the importance of us to continue conversations around um, the Hazara people in general, but also with the specific focus on Hazara women. Uh, as we've mentioned in today's talks, uh, the many dimensional uh, uh, lenses that can be applied in order to really analyze uh, the injustices, the discrimination and the violence that, that Hazara women have, have suffered and continue to suffer to this day. Uh, thank you very much.